So I always have to start my talks these days with a disclaimer to make sure that you understand that I might not know what I'm talking about. And so therefore, if you don't like it, and there may be some things in the talk that you don't like, you can always comfort yourself by saying, perhaps she doesn't really understand what she's talking about. My PhD is in computer science, and what we're going to talk about today comes from the field of cognitive neuroscience. And what we know about that science is that they make progress, as opposed to some slower-moving sciences like computer science. Ooh. And the reason for that is very simple. In science, you follow the scientific method. And the scientific method says you have an hypothesis, and then you devise a clever experiment to test that hypothesis, and then you examine the results, do some analysis, and decide whether or not to proceed on the basis of that earlier hypothesis or whether you need to make some serious adjustments. Those are controlled, balanced experiments. So the psychologists and the neuroscientists are experts. They do a good job of that, and so they learn. If you pick up a paper about our industry that was written yesterday and one that was written 20 years ago, the problems are still the same. We're still debating some of these issues over and over again. And of course, searching always for the latest silver bullet and never looking for that research, those controlled, balanced experiments. So we're not really a science, are we? So I am going to cite a lot of research, and if you'd like to know where I got that, if you'd like to read that paper or that book, send me some email and I'll be happy to give you that information, although this is not an academic presentation, so I'm not going to cite everything along the way. So let's talk about mindset. What the researchers tell us is there are basically two ways of looking at talent or ability or intelligence. Well, can you read the screen? The first one says that you believe that what you have when you're born in the way of talent or intelligence is what you have. It's fixed. And there's really not much you can do about that. You are a natural at playing a sport or at programming or doing whatever you do. Or, I'm sorry, you just don't have it. It's the talent myth. And many times in our organizations, we spend a lot of effort trying to identify those people who have it, believing in that fixed mindset. The alternative is, yes, you are born with a set of characteristics and abilities. Yes, that's true. But Whatever that set of characteristics or abilities, you can always improve. You can get better. Of course, it's possible to measure where you are now. There are IQ tests and SAT tests and other ways of doing that. But there is no test that can say what you will be like tomorrow or next week or next month if you decide that you want to be better at whatever that talent or ability is. So I call that the agile mindset. It's the belief in growth. It's the belief in learning. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I am going to ask you to think about that 
what mindset do you hold? And realize we don't have that consistent view over everything. There are some areas in our lives where we do tend to be fixed and others where we are more agile. So most of us don't hold one or the other all the time, but we do usually have one that dominates. We tend to lean toward the fixed mindset or the agile mindset. And this is with respect to anything, any ability, any characteristic, including raw intelligence. So I gave a talk about this at the Agile Conference and what I thought was important about learning the research behind the two mindsets and what an enormous impact it can have on your life and the way you work. And if you have children, on the lives and the potential of those children as well. So if you haven't seen it, it is online and the slides will be available. You can go look that up. The basic research was done by someone named Carol Dweck. She's at Stanford University. She's written an easily accessible book. If you'd like to learn a little more, this is not a long tome and it is written for the lay reader, not the expert. So it's called simply Mindset. It's a good place to begin. There are also some free online articles. The first one by Malcolm Gladwell who examined in an article called The Talent Myth, The Two Mindsets, and the research that's been done by Carol Dweck. The second in New York Magazine, and lastly, Time Magazine did a feature article on Carol Dweck and the impact of her research, and then there are a couple of links that point to more papers. Those are all free. They won't take a lot of time if you'd like to read more about these. So we've got the two mindsets. That's interesting. But what's really important for us is to look at what that mindset means about all of the other aspects of our lives. So the first thing we've got here is it determines the kinds of goals that you seek. So let's think about that for a minute. If you have a fixed mindset, that means that you believe that what you have natural ability or not, there's nothing you can do about that. And so therefore, you spend a lot of time trying to show everybody else that you have it. So your goals are all about making your performance look good. You always want to look good. Because if you don't, that must indicate that you don't have it. It's a clear sign to anyone who's watching that maybe you're not a good programmer or a good developer or a good manager or whatever it is that you want to be. You always want to look good. And that leads even small children to choose goals that are easy. So maybe those of you who were at the meeting last night, the user group around women in IT, and last year I gave a talk about that, that this is what happens to little girls. Little girls, especially bright little girls, have the most fixed mindset on the planet. And why is that? Well, they're told from the very beginning that they're perfect. Because in the beginning they are. Little girls have good language skills, good people skills. They know what their parents want. They know what their teachers want. And in the beginning, in grade school, they do very well. They're at the top of their class. And they hear it from parents, from grandparents, aunts, and uncles. All their teachers say, oh, you're so perfect. You're so smart. And they begin to believe, I have it. I have it. I was born with it. Their mindsets are fixed. Now, the problem with that mindset is that sooner or later, you do run into something where you don't do well. And that causes cognitive dissonance. Uh-oh, I thought I had it. I thought I was talented. I thought I was smart. I thought I was perfect. And now, 
I see that I'm not able to do very well. And that's exactly what happens to bright little girls. They start running into hard stuff as they leave grade school and they begin to take a difficult math class or a different science class. It's a little more challenging. And oh no, oh no, they don't do so well. So they move away. They find other areas where they can always look good. They choose their goals. So they always look like they have it. Well, all the research shows that there can be other traits that we have in addition to these, but that this is the driver for these factors for determining performance goals. And then, of course, reaction to failure. If someone has a fixed mindset and things aren't going so well and they do make mistakes or fail, they're very upset by that. And in fact, if we stay with the bright little girls, what many of them begin to tell themselves as they have failures is, I must not be very good at this. Well, I must not be very smart at math or science. I'm not so good. I better go over somewhere else so that I will, I will have a chance at succeeding. So those that have the agile mindset, on the other hand, know that what it's about is getting better. And when they fail and they don't do so well, they say, well, it's okay, I, I'm, I can learn, I can improve, I can, I can get better. Failure is not a serious problem. And the goals they choose are goals where they can be challenged. I want to have a chance to improve. I believe that I can. And then finally, the belief about whether it's a good thing to work hard or whether it makes a difference, what kind of strategy you use that if you're a fixed mindset person, you believe that you don't have to work hard. In fact, if you have to work hard, that's an indication that you don't have it. Whereas for the agile mindset, that's what you do. You do have to decide to work hard. You do have to decide to pick strategies that will work. And then finally, how you feel about others and when they do well. Those with a fixed mindset regard that as competition. There's only so many pieces in the pie. So if that person is doing well, oh no, maybe that might mean that they're better, they have more talent than I do, that are threatened by that. Those with the agile mindset know that the pie is ever expanding. It's okay, I rejoice in your success. It gives me hope. I could possibly be as good as you are someday. So the mind is almost like a muscle for those with the agile mindset. They believe the harder you work, the better you'll be. And in fact, the most encouraging research about getting older, and believe me, I pay attention to all of that research. The most encouraging thing is, it's okay to get old. You're not ever going to come to a point where you say, that's it. You can continue to grow. You can continue to build bone. You can continue to build muscle. You can continue to build connections between the neurons in your brain as long as you work at it, as long as you continue to learn, as long as you continue to work those muscles and work those bones until you die you can continue to grow. So the Agile mindset is the reality. The research clearly shows that. I think that's very encouraging. You're so young, you're not worried about your brain or your muscles or your bones. You should be. <laughs> Unfortunately, those with the fixed mindset, they say, no, no, it's not like a muscle. It's like height. You're born with it or not. There's nothing you can do about it. Makes a big difference in a wide spectrum of attributes about our lives. These two mindsets. 
So here's the talk for today. That was a little bit of an introduction. What we know about people with a fixed mindset is they're more likely to stereotype others. They believe that what we all have is fixed, that you're born with it or you're not. And furthermore, it should be pretty easy to determine whether you have it or not. So in stereotyping, what the brain does is make categories of people based on obvious characteristics like race. Clearly, those people who are that color are not as good as the people who are this color. And so therefore, we categorize all the people in those various categories as being exactly alike. So we enable them all with the same set of fixed characteristics. So the fixed mindset not only affects how you see your own talent and ability, but how you see the talents and abilities of others. Now, we're hardwired to stereotype. There's no way we can avoid it. I gave a talk about that at another Agile conference, and I think that's online as well. It's called, Who Do You Trust? But what we can do is be aware that we are doing it. We can be aware that we have that tendency. And what we know is that those who have the Agile mindset, yes, they do stereotype, but they're a little looser about it, and they're a little more willing to withhold judgment longer, and they're willing to learn about those individuals before they fit, in, fit those individuals into that hardwired category, so they are less likely to stereotype. All right, let's all have a silent prayer to the computer gods and let us hope that this video will work. Dear computer gods, please make it work. Yes, blue fairy, make me real. Make me real, blue fairy. Come on. You're not praying. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. Sorry. to show that in Denmark? <laughs> Thanks to the Carlsberg folks who said, sure, you can put that in your PowerPoint presentation. Absolutely. So that's stereotyping. Those two people came in, they looked at the theater, it was full of those people. And they could see only two empty seats. And most people walked right out again. Now, you wouldn't do that. Would you? If you really wanted to see the movie, you would go right in there, and what you'd get as a result is you'd not only get to see the movie, but you'd have a whole room full of new friends and some free beer. Now, how is that? <laughs> Unfortunately, most of us do that all the time. 
It keeps our brain very busy making judgments about other people, whether they're good or bad, whether they're smart or not. And we do it on the basis of a lot of things, not necessarily whether they're covered with tattoos, but some kinds of characteristics that we are not even aware of. How did we decide that we don't like that person? Or that we do? Or that we think that person is smart, but not that person? Or that this person is better than that one? How did you make up your mind about that? Sometimes it's not so obvious. And the disturbing thing about stereotypes is that we believe them even if we're a member of the stereotyped group. So I'm definitely concerned about whether women choose to go into math or science or not. And there was a classic experiment that was done giving women a very difficult math test. And they had two groups of people who took the test. And in one group, in the beginning of the test, there's a little bit of information, the name, the grade level, and a little tiny box that said male or female. And the other version of the test was exactly the same, except no little box. That was the only difference. So would you think a little tiny box could make a big difference in a difficult test? Could that skew the test results, just that little box? What do you think? Well, I wouldn't be talking about it <laughs> if it didn't make a big difference, because it did. And what's really interesting about that experiment is that afterwards, the women who took the exams were asked, did you notice there was a little box? Did you notice that you checked male, female, and these were all women in the test, so they all checked female. Do you remember that? And none of them even remembered checking the box. But clearly, some part of their brain was paying attention, noticing that, oh, oh, I am female. Oh, we know women are not very good at math. Yeah. So we not only apply those stereotypes to other people, if we are a member of a stereotyped group, we apply them to ourselves. No, it was only, it was only women. There was a checkbox for male, but there were only women taking the test. Now, when the test is run with males and the women don't have to check the box, they're just as good as the guys. So why would it make such a difference? Because it was a subtle reminder, even if they weren't aware of it, a subtle reminder that you're a member of a stereotyped group that doesn't do well in math. Sorry. Women are really nice people, aren't they? Yes, and we like to have them around. Actually, we need them. We need them, otherwise we'd be in real trouble. We wouldn't have any, any more generations following us. So yes, we better keep them around. And they are useful as well. They can do a lot of things, but they're just not very good at math or science or some of the other hard things. We all know that. And clearly, the research shows that women believe that as well. We are our own worst enemies. So I know you don't have time to look up all the URLs in the world, but this one is about an interesting experiment that was done by a third grade teacher the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. She taught in a small town in Iowa where everybody's pretty much the same. They're all white. They all go to the same church. Their backgrounds were very similar. No black people in that town in Iowa. How was she going to explain to them what had happened with the assassination of Martin Luther King? Why did he die? And what was that cause that he was fighting for? What was that all about? And how could she make them feel it, really feel it, 
what was going on, the struggles in the South during the civil rights movement. So she came up with a brilliant idea. When her students came in that next day, she said, I, I want to rearrange the seating. We're going to put all the blue-eyed children over here on this side. And the brown-eyed children, well, you'll sit over here. Because I've just read some interesting research, and the research tells me that the brown-eyed children are smarter than the blue-eyed children. So I'm going to spend most of my time now teaching the brown-eyed children. And the blue-eyed children, well, we'll have some coloring books, some toys. We'll keep you busy. But it's not your fault that you're not as smart. Oh, one other thing. Just so we don't forget, Let's have all the blue-eyed children wear a little collar. So when we see the collar, it will remind us, yeah, they're just not as smart. So years later, and that's what this PBS special is about, they interviewed the now grown-up children and when they talked to the blue-eyed children, they all said the same thing. When she put that collar around my neck, I felt stupid. She created stupidity by labeling them and by making them wear that little collar. So the danger in stereotypes is that we create reality. We create a whole group of people who can't contribute. We create a group of people who feel stupid, who feel that they can't contribute, who feel that they're just not quite as good as those other people, we can actually change their performance. And of course, this is especially true for managers. Mm. How many managers in the room? Come on, come on. Yeah. yeah, I read some research just recently. It said, you know, when managers bring in new people, it doesn't take long, just sometimes a matter of hours, before they've already decided who's going to work out, who's going to be a good guy, and who isn't. So long before they've ever had a chance to see real performance or evaluate it in an objective way, they've already made up their minds. Not you, of course but other managers. So I wondered about that, and I sat down at a table with some managers that I knew, and I said, I just read this interesting research. Tell me, is that true, that you make up your minds pretty quickly about whether people are going to work out or not? Do you do that just almost instantly? Well, they said... Hmm, I guess we do, but we're always right. <laughs> of course they are. Of course they are always right. Why is that? Because if they believe that you're a good guy and that you've got it and that you're going to be great, that is exactly what they will see like the brown-eyed children. Well, we know they're smarter. Therefore, we expect that they will do well, and that creates a reality around that expectation. Whereas if we don't think you're going to be a good guy, you're not going to work out, and that sets our expectation, that what's, that's what we'll see. So you're not really objective 
about even concrete data that you might pick up, whether you're measuring or whether you're not, whether you're what you see and what you don't see. And actually, this has been known for quite a while. I have this Harvard Business Review article if you would like to read it, so otherwise I think they're going to try to charge you money for it. So it's, the, it's called Pygmalion. And it's simply that if managers believe that you're going to be okay, you will be. And if they believe you're not going to be okay, you won't. Enormous power that not only the managers, but everybody else on the team can exert that power on other team members, can create great contributions or not. Kind of scary. So that we know both of these mindsets have to do with goals, the kinds of performance goals you set for yourself, the kinds of learning goals that you set for yourself, the fixed mindset, they look all over the place so that they can look good, so their performance makes them appear as though they have it. And what happens to people over time is that that's the only kind of goal they ever have, and they stop learning. And they stop believing that mistakes are bad. Mistakes must be an indication that you don't have it. Mistakes are bad. Effort is for dummies. So here's the good news, that you can have a mindset, absolutely. We've got plenty of research that shows that it's going to be agile or it's going to be fixed, but you can change it. In other words, the mindset itself is agile. You're not stuck with one or the other. And what we know is that you can grow that. You can grow the agile mindset in members of your team. You can grow that mindset in your children, in your spouse, in your friends, simply by the way you interact and the kind of feedback that you give. And sometimes the research is pretty clear that you don't have to do giant, big things, just small, little, simple things can make an enormous difference in how you change the lives of others. You have a lot of power. So here are some suggestions. You can praise others for a good job, absolutely. But when you do it, never, if you can avoid it, and this is such a hard habit to break, if you can avoid it, don't ever say, you're so smart. You must be a genius at this. Don't ever say, you have some level of ability, some talent some level of intelligence. Say instead, you must have really put in a lot of effort on this. Wow, you must have tried some unusual things. Praise the strategy or process that was used. Ask about how they accomplished what they did. Oh, tell me about how you finally fixed that bug. I've been working on it now for two weeks and I wasn't able to get anywhere. Can you help me learn? something new about what you did. And instead of brushing failure under the rug, bring it out, celebrate it. This is especially true for your children. Instead of telling them, you're so perfect, you're so smart, encourage them to fail, it's okay. To deal with failure is the most valuable lesson you can give your children or each other. That failure is a good thing. It's about learning. When you try, when you struggle, when you have challenges, you have a chance to learn. You have a chance to get better. And share your stories. I failed too. I have failed many times. And here's what I learned from that. It's okay to do that. And we know that many times people get discouraged, especially women. We heard these stories last night 
about how they thought, even though they had struggled to get a degree and they had struggled to get a job and they got a job and they got in the workplace and they s instead that little voice in their heads kept telling them, you can't do this. You just don't have it. And when they had failure, when they weren't able to do so well, the little voice really cranked up the volume and said, see, I told you, you better go do something else where you can have some success. Don't spend your time here. This is a waste of time. So you need something for that little voice in your head. So tell others. Say, no, 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 the brain, talent, intelligence, any ability you have, it's like a muscle. Use it. Keep getting better. You don't have some fixed amount of talent so that you're doomed forever to fail. No, you can learn from this and move on. We tend to get down on ourselves. People we know well, our spouses, our children, get down on themselves. I can't do it. I can't do it, Dad. I can't do it, Mom. It's too hard. So you need some other words some other ways of telling them, because normally the argument goes, oh yes, you can, you are smart. And that is exactly the wrong argument, because you're reinforcing the fixed mindset. So don't counter those feelings of inadequacy and depression by saying, no, no, you're wrong, you are smart, you are talented, you are intelligent, because that's exactly what we do. And that doesn't help them because they simply say, mm, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. So the message has to be instead, failure is okay. It's about learning. It's about struggling. We all have to struggle and share your own personal stories. I've, I've gone through that as well. So I know you can't read this and I'm going to ask what time. Good, okay. So I'm, gonna I'm not going to read it. The reason these things are in here is that after I gave the talk at the Agile conference, I got a ton of email. And it said, I heard your talk and that's really great, but what do I tell my kids? I wanna know some words. Can you give me some words that I can use? Can you give me some little phrases? Can you give me some arguments? And so I created these very detailed slides so that you can have them. So here's what you can tell your kids. Instead of you're so smart, say, I'm proud that you really worked hard on that. So you can download these slides later and take notes if you want. Something to tell yourself when you're down on yourself, because that happens a lot. Instead of having the little voice in your head say, oh, I guess I'm stupid. I guess I can't do this. I guess I'll never learn. Maybe I'll just go home and have a beer and forget about it. So say to yourself words of encouragement about learning and about taking advantage of failure. So, and again, you can read all of this on your own time. And for others, what are some words that you can tell the other people in your life when they become discouraged and when they need some way of reminding them the power of the Agile mindset? So this, of course, connects to Agile software because that is the message. You know, we spend a lot of time arguing, is it about the backlog? People are throwing the backlog out and say, well, there goes Scrum. Well, Scrum does have a backlog, but Scrum and all the Agile practices have, I think, a common core, which is simply this, the Agile mindset. That it is about learning, it's about trying something, about having little experiments. So what I did was I went out and I copied all of the statements that I could see in various web pages and blogs about Agile that had to do with failure. And I found fail early, fail often, fail fast, learn constantly. Failure is an option. Without failure, how can learning happen? 
Make mistakes faster. If you don't know what Menlo Innovations is, it is the most agile company on the planet. Go to their website, menloinnovations.com, and look at how you build a company from the ground up in an agile way. Perfect is a verb. So it's really perfect. It's not about being perfect. It's about getting better. Those that fail fastest grow strongest. And I just finally had to stop because the quotes are all over the place. Agile is about the agile mindset. It is about learning, experimenting. So agile is agile. Agile development has the agile mindset. It's about believing that we're all a work in progress and that that fixed mindset, no, that has nothing to do with the way we operate. We're going to get better over time, and so are you. And someday when you're 70, maybe you'll be up in front sharing some information because you're still going to be learning. I just read some interesting research about old people. They did a longitudinal experiment, went over 40 years. And in the balanced, controlled experiment, they were comparing one thing, which is, what do you think old people are like? And for the people who thought that old people, well, you know, they stereotype them and believe they really can't do too much. Whereas the other group believed that, no, no, getting older, well, that's okay. There are lots of people who are older who are doing all kinds of exciting things. And over the course of 40 years, they noticed something interesting in the group of people that held a negative age stereotype. They began to age sooner. They began to have high blood pressure, strokes, heart problems, and they died sooner. So I'm going to give you the greatest gift possible. You stereotype old people based on me. <laughs> I am your role model. I turned 70 in March. So another bit of research has to do with 70-year-olds. 70-year-olds now are so much better than they were a generation ago. And in a generation hence, even better. I wish I could see you at 70. Because you are going to be amazing. You already are. Thanks for listening. Matt, can my official timekeeper, are we good? You're good. Okay, do we have? You got time for questions? We, we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions? Yes. Uh, when you talk about the, these two mindsets. I think it's, it, it's very difficult, even the researchers themselves, who know the power of holding the agile mindset, have said, I know I'm not agile all the time. And they find themselves tripping over uh, words, because it does have to do with the kinds of words that you use in conversations with others and in conversations with themselves. They find they're tripping over things that are definitely fixed. So it, it's something that can change over time, yes, and it's something that maybe with, even within a particular domain, we kind of go back and forth. And it's like a lot of other things that we have inherited or hardwired that we're stuck with that and awareness is a, our only defense. So be aware when you are judging others. Be aware if you're saying, oh, you're so smart. Because what we say, when we say somebody is so smart, the implication is, well, other people then must not be. And that would include sometimes me. Oh, you're so smart, I must not be. So that kind of labeling sets up that fixed mind stereotype. 
But yeah, you're right. None of us is all of the time one or the other. Yeah, any other questions? I just, re- I just realized I forgot to repeat the earlier question and he's chastising me from the back. So his question has to do with gender differences which are clearly there. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. Clearly gender differences, different ways of thinking. Were, wouldn't some of those be more applicable to certain areas? And I think there are, I didn't cite it here, but there are so many studies that show what you want on your software team. Actually, what you want on any team is diversity. And what we tend to have, because we like people who are like us, is we avoid diversity. We want to hire people who are just like us because we believe that we're smart and we are good at whatever it is. So we tend to look for other people just like us and we build teams where there is almost no diversity. So what women bring to the table is what anyone would bring to the table who is not exactly like us is a different point of view. And that that's going to make some times things a little more difficult because we're going to have to hear those different points of view but the end result research shows so much better because that same research also shows that if the team is all women it's not very good so we all need to be there we need to be around the table and make our own contributions but you're right it's probably a different contribution but I think it's valuable Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, the rate of so the question is, isn't it true that learning does slow down as you get older? And I have just read some interesting research about owls. So owls go through an interesting adjustment. When they're born, they have to coordinate their vision with their hearing. And it takes a little bit of time before they can do that. And so what they tried to do was say, well, what about an owl that's already an adult? Can they make that adjustment? Can they learn how to do that? And the original experiment said, no, they can't. In fact, we now tend to believe that there are certain things you can't do as you get older. So that's why I thought this research was especially interesting. And then a brilliant person on the team who happened to be a woman said, wait a minute, let's do this experiment differently. Instead of having the owls try to make the adjustment in one big jump, said they were asking them to adjust, they were wearing little glasses that altered the difference between their hearing and their vision by a certain number of degrees. Let's cut that down. Instead of making it 23 degrees, let's make it, say, five. Let's make it five degrees and see if the older owls can do that. And sure enough, they could. They could do it. And then they could do the next five, and the next five, and the next five. So they could do exactly what the younger owls could do. They were just a little slower. So I think that you're right. The research does seem to be pretty clear. We're a little slower, but we are also more of a perfectionist. So when we take those little steps, we don't move forward unless we make sure we've got them exactly right. So you have a different learning style as you get older. You know that you can't sometimes just jump in and fail and learn quickly. You're going to have to take your time, but you can get to the same place. And maybe along the way, you've learned some things that the others haven't. Other questions? We're good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.